Hi, I'm Rory Greener from XR Today, bringing you the latest in news and conversation from the extended reality space. Today, we'll be discussing prisms of reality and the benefits of having XR as a learning tool. Joining me today is Anarupa Ganguly, founder and CEO of Prisms. Welcome. Hey, Rory. So good to be here. Thanks for joining me. Could you give our viewers a brief introduction to Prisms of Reality? Yeah, sure thing. So at Prisms, we're building a virtual reality platform that rapidly improves engagement and proficiencies uh, in secondary math and science. So in terms of really what uh, brought upon Prisms, uh, the, the, the company was started about 18 months ago uh, with the support of the National Science Foundation and really sits upon decades of experiences as, a, as an educator, a teacher, and district administrator. Uh, so my STEM journey really began as a student. I was an electrical engineering and computer science student at MIT, and that was my first confrontation with what the achievement gap looks like as I watched many of my peers who were young women and, and students of, of color drop out throughout my tenure as I got to grad school. And it really started my lifelong love affair around what's happening at the K-12 math and science level such that when those understandings are pressure tested where you know kids have to uh, contribute and create versus just reproduce, they really fall apart. And so to better understand that the root causes of this, I became a high school math and physics teacher in the Boston Public Schools. And, and since then have served in a few different capacities. Uh, I was the director of math in Boston, a smaller system, um, about 50, 55,000 kids, and then moved over to New York City where I had 1.2 million um, students. And then most recently, I was the Dean of Math and Engineering at Success Academies. Uh, and you know what I really found, Rory, at the, at, at, over the course of the last you know, 15 to 20 years of doing this work is that we just don't have the tools to close these learning gaps at scale. Uh, and there are a few reasons for that, but wanted to kind of pause and, and, and get your, your thoughts and reactions. It's interesting to hear. I think it's curious to know what did you, how did you identify this need while as an active student and teacher? Yeah, absolutely. So what I learned is that, you know, everything that learning science has, has taught us over the past 15 years that uh, students inherently learn experientially. They learn by seeing, by doing, by moving. I mean, kinesthetic activity is such a core part of conceptual of mathematical ideas. And additionally, um, I learned as I, as, I, as I was doing my, my research um, as, as an educator is that the top indicators of success in STEM is, uh, are one, your ability to spatially reason. You know, our world is 3D, it's not 2D. So the way that we measure that is your ability to rotate 3D objects in your mind and maintain perspective of that object. Um, and two, your ability to abstract. So, you know, uh, being able to go through everyday real world problems in your life and abstracting up from that physical experience to create mathematical models and then use them to, to solve a problem that's compelling to you. And I'm looking at these is what I'm looking at the research and the best practices and going, none of my learning tools or my, my, my uh, computer apps um, that I use in the classroom today are going to allow me to enact that pedagogy for my kids to learn um, in the ways that they learn uh, learn best. And so that was really the impetus for 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 the company is we know how how we learn. We've known for a long time, and yet we didn't have the technology to really scale it and not just you know build an experience here or there, but really create a systems change solution um, that could span. Uh, grades five to 12 math and the physical sciences, because it's, it's that kind of, um, you know, it, it's the it's the solutions that know how to integrate within the current day to day of districts and schools that are going to allow a real change versus what a lot of what we've seen quite a lot with ed tech solutions is they get thrown into schools um, without a, a ton of um, thought around how is this going to be implemented uh, what is the teacher roadmap? What is the the uh, the preparation needed to both plan for and execute at a high level? So you know the the the, the product as as, I, as I've conceived of it, it has the pedagogical aspect, as in uh, we have to teach kids in the ways that they learn for better retention, engagement, and purpose in the, in the modern math classroom. But we also have to have an implementation apparatus that really sets educators up in the schedules and the time that they have to implement these more aspirational technologies. So how did um, schemes like the WXR funding, the SBIR phase one grant, how did these 
opportunities help you to develop that integration and that widespread rollout? I think today, both virtual reality um, as, a, as a medium of instruction uh, and the, the K-12 market, both of those are often seen as high risk. Um, there's, there's a lot to de-risk from both the market as well as the, the, the technical and content perspective. And so the best way for, for me to start PRISM was through the support of the National Science Foundation. The NSF SBIR program uh, is intended to fund founders that are trying to build really aspirational products, uh, but have quite a lot of technical risk to, to de-risk before they can go after um, equity funding. And so we were able to launch with NSBIR phase one. And what that allowed me to do was build our first learning module in algebra. Uh, the work that we had to do was figuring out how do you modulate the many, many, many knobs and, and facets of VR uh, to create a focused learning experience where kids learn. So there were there were three key things that we had to do. We had to we had to build it, um, we had to test it, and then we had to start building kind of the the, the data analytics and then the teacher roadmap that would allow um, the such VR learning modules to live and breathe within the, within the classroom setting. What came out of our NSF phase one was that. Uh, all the, the kids we tested with across schools in New York City, Boston, KIPP, and then Lee County in Florida, uh, we saw an average of 20% growth on learning outcomes immediately. That was without any offline practice, any procedural work, um, just by doing the VR modules that, that, that we, had, we had developed. Um, and, and we just found an incredible response from teachers. Teachers are typically, they're very wary, right? They've been fed a lot of, um, they've met a lot of snake oil salesmen in their life. Uh, and so just to, just seeing that response from, from teachers and kids throughout our NSF phase one really motivated us to say, I think we're ready. We, we have to get this to market to get it in front of more educators and kids to get more feedback and rapidly improve our product. Um, the market is ready. And that moment in time coincided with um, a huge amount of funding that, that's, that's come from the federal government by way of COVID relief bills for schools and districts to really uh, attack uh, learning losses um, that, that, that have just widened during the pandemic. And so I, I opened uh, our first round of uh, funding um, in, in March of, of this year, I closed it in June, and my team and I have been accelerating quickly uh, to, to, to get our product it, it, it in the hands of as many kids as possible. So we, we began with launching to 10,000 students this, this uh, month. Um, and, you know, the way that we conceive of, of our solution, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, all the schools we're working with uh, is, is one cart of headsets. It's a class set that multiple educators are able to share. So it's, it is a tremendous kind of uh, weight to bear in terms of the hardware investment. Uh, and, you know, one thing that, we've been really categorical about is that VR isn't for every day. So all of all of these core design elements have allowed us to rapidly um, scale across schools, though uh, we just started a year ago. So what was the reaction like from teachers and how have institutes uh, adapted to teaching with PRISM solutions and perhaps VR generally? I've really been surprised. I think that having done a lot of teacher professional development over the past 10 years, I was expecting um, a little bit more pushback. I think that because teachers look at the product and they say, hey, this is this was built by teachers. I mean, that's like immediately obvious when, when you when you open it up. Uh, B, there, you know, that innate reason why they all got into teaching, which was to have, you know, give kids relevant real world reasons to to do and love math. Um, for them to very naturally work through math problems uh, and for them, for students to have a myriad of sense making tools, because some some kids are dancers and they use a lot of movement to make sense of structure. Um, so, so some students really need that that um, visual and, and haptic understanding of, of graphs and, and mathematical concepts through our interactive graph um Module. So there's so many different ways in which kids can now sense make these math concepts that teachers have traditionally taught in a very abstract way and had a lot of difficulty um, getting kids to understand these ideas. Uh, so teachers have largely been, this is how I've always wanted to learn. This is great. Now, there's that the second part of the of early adoption, which is um, there are kings to work out. Headsets are arriving. How do you store them? How do you charge them? 
um, making sure that, uh, you know, you, you have a system for your rechargeable batteries, making sure kids have their fabric masks because we are in the time of the pandemic and we have to be very mindful about um, carrying devices. So a lot of the last few weeks have been focused on really ironing out all the implementation kinks that are required to operationalize VR. I, I mentioned this before, but, you know, we're product rich, we're system poor. And so what we are over investing right now on the system side, which are required to operationalize something that teachers want to operationalize. They want it in their classrooms. They love it. Kids are loving it. Teachers are loving the smiles on kids' faces. And kids saying, oh, my gosh, I never understood what an exponential function is. I finally understood it. I, I sat through two years of algebra, had no idea what I was doing, got A's in those classes. Uh, but now I, I understand what this mathematical construct is physically and um, uh, in terms of the model itself. So the long and the short of it is I think that the, the response is really positive, but that's come from a real effort from, from my team to make sure that from the time headsets arrive, teachers are handheld and supported um, around what integration looks like so that they're not left trying to figure out, well, how do I integrate this into my current curriculum in my classroom? It sounds like PRISMs have helped teachers to understand the value in PRISMs, but then also learn the value of VR as a learning tool. Absolutely. I think what's really important, I was just having a conversation with, with a partner about this, is we don't go in saying we're, we're, we're selling a VR solution. We're not. VR is our how. We are selling math outcomes. You have a huge math problem. We have had that for decades now. You haven't been able to solve it because the solutions that you're using don't get to the root causes. The root causes are, you know, building a child's ability to abstract, building a child's ability to spatially reason, building a child's connection to great problems in their society today. That's what we needed to, to scale. And we couldn't. So what we're selling is the pedagogy, the outcomes the teacher joy and support, and the VR is the how. And I think it's really, really important that that we remember that because that was the mistake we made in educational technology for a long time. We were selling the platform. We were selling the tech. But without clarity of the use case and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, um, those are going to quickly fizzle out or just start collecting dust in your in your closet. So then how is PRISM um, specifically innovating and redefining STEM learning? I think there, there are a few things. So WestEd is our research partner this year. Um, that research is, is, is largely funded by the NIH and the NSF. And we're, we're really looking at two things. We're looking at how much better do students learn and how much faster do they, do they learn? I have a conjecture that using VR and when, when you teach the right modalities, kids are going to learn way faster. So a 10-month algebra class, the jury's out on whether you need 10 months to learn Algebra 1. Because right now there's so much inefficiency in the system where we're reteaching and relearning, reteaching and the remediation causes you know, more disengagement. So I think in terms of reinvention, one is uh, really redefining what a, an, a math class means when you're learning in all the right ways. Um, two, like I said, is efficacy. So how much better are they learning? Um, and then third, as, I, as I've said a, a few times now, when we think about what, what it means to reinvent math, um, it's really uh, thinking about the pedagogies that we've all as educators wanted to, to use for so long. And all we've done is just actualize that. So instead of students learning an equation and then learning a bunch of properties and then memorizing if then statements, if you see this word, do this, if you see multiplication, it means exponential growth and then running a procedure over and over again, We've re redefined that learning mechanism or that learning art, where now students are immersed in a relevant problem that creates the intellectual need for math, that creates a curiosity for math. And then they accept a mission because everything is, it's not game driven, it's mission driven. It's, it's a problem that's urgent and important. Um, and then it's through that exploration of that problem that they connect that physical experience they had to, um, you know, more abstract mathematical models from the 3D in my body to the simulation to the 2D graphs and tables, and finally the equation, and, and really teaching that skill of abstraction over and over again. It's that um, re reinventing math has essentially meant for, for me and for, for my team, creating a new learning mechanism for math. Um, and that learning mechanism is really based on going from a problem that I feel in my body up to a mathematical model, which I can then use to solve something in my community that feels emotionally important to me. 
That's really interesting. And it sounds like you're creating like a new opportunity rather than just a new VR solution. And I think when I've, well, from what I've gathered from the solution as well, you have a real time synchronized e-learning platform with immersive VR visualizations. How does this bring benefit to the learning process? Yeah, so to get kind of give you a sense of what that what the, the student experience looks like um, and what the teacher experience looks like. So a student, I will take the case of our one of our our algebra modules. Our first module was on the pandemic. So students put their headsets on and they're transported to a food hall. Um, and there's a mayor's announcement, there's a lockdown, and they get the superpower to to understand the the actions that they just took and those around them. Um, how did the virus spread? So, you know, they're getting this, this visceral understanding of multiplicative growth. But right now, the, school, the, the, the school's product, the student is in there by themselves. The teacher is not in the VR environment with the child. Um, this, the student, the teacher has a synchronous data dashboard, browser-based, runs on their tablets or laptops, whatever they use in the classroom. And they get to really get a play-by-play -play on what students are doing and what they might need help on. Um, the second part of the module, which is where the math really kicks in, um, is where students accept their mission. How many weeks until the hospitals in your community are going to reach capacity? Um, and they use, you know, simulations and data visualization tools to create a table um, and then to analyze that table and break structurally break it down uh, and then connect that to their equation, which they then use to solve the problem. But what teachers are able to do is see what are they doing? You know, how did they calculate the table? What tools were they using? When were they going back and using their, their 3D writing pen to annotate their data visualization tools? Uh, to give you an example of um, a teacher-student interaction, when the student goes to create the equation, let's say they don't understand that it's an exponential function off the bat because they're coming out of their linear functions uh, unit of study. And they're like, okay, you know, I'm going to put in a linear equation. Uh, then at that point, you know, we have a lot of um, unsolicited hints. We have an, a, a simple rule-based hint architecture in our modules right now, which we will be evolving over time as, as, as we scale. But students can then, um, you know, they, they can get a hint. They can kind of keep working through it. And a teacher is able to, in real time, see what they're doing. Okay, if they first put in a, a linear equation. They then got this hint. They then went back and they were annotating their data visualization and they realized, ooh, um, my, my rate of change needs to be higher. But they didn't realize that the pattern of change of the function itself is wrong. So they increased the slope. So instead of 5T, they put in 10T. That's a perfect moment for a teacher to say, send the teacher, send the student a message and say, hey, grab your, your writing tool and go back to your table and, and, and annotate what's happening between rows two and three. Look at that change again. And, it's, and the teacher can immediately see that feedback. Did the student read the message? Did they grab the writing pen? Did they go do something else? And so then they're able to follow up with additional feedback. But what's been really fun for teachers is that typically when they give feedback right now, it's based on pretty low level data. Like did the, did the student get it right or wrong? Um, it's, it's what we call performance data. Whereas now teachers have a lot of sense making data. They have this series of actions, behaviors, movements, um, as well as, as well as the answer submissions to really kind of figure out what kids are thinking, uh, what types of tools they're using into what end and how they might help them use some of the other tools in a more strategic way. So it's, it, it is a new way. It's, it's an assistive approach in that the teacher is not delivering the content. The teacher is using high impact data. Uh, while kids are working, but it's not the zany process, which is typically is for teachers where um, problem-based learning in the classroom has, has historically been very difficult to implement because the teacher launches the question and she's running around like a, a, a mad woman uh, trying to figure out like which kids are struggling and you have to pause and ask a ton of questions to figure out the misconceptions and then give them feedback. But then Tony over there, he has an, an affordance on his IEP that is, is being ignored. So it's been largely impossible, which is why teachers have maintained control of the classroom, because that's the only way learning can happen. But now what we're able to do with, with our solution is kids are entirely focused, engaged, and using these multimodal tools, which again, allows and opens up a lot of representations of thought and creative ways for students to think about mathematical structure. And so you have much higher levels of productive struggle, much higher levels of perseverance, which just as a classroom management strategy is game changing for a teacher. Um, but then her role is, 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 is very feasible. She's, she's, she's able to kind of sit with her, her data dashboard. It's ranked which kids are where and which kids are, are, are most vulnerable and at risk of not completing the instructional objectives so she can really focus her time 
Um, and I think, you know, the, we, one of the things that we want to learn more about to these early pilots is to what extent we do teachers need co-presence? To what extent do we need real-time casting? Um, we do have a, a, a partnership with T-Mobile to run our uh, app on the 5G network across 10 Title I schools to understand the value of really having more meaningful looks into the student environment. Um, and so the, the teacher-student feedback system is incredibly important again, for oper operationalizing this across schools and districts. And we have a lot to learn this fall around what that relationship looks like um, and what and, and what it really means to use high impact ana analytics in real time um, to support student productive struggle. So obviously there was a lot of student struggle during the COVID-19 pandemic. What did you learn and what was feedback like from students studying under that condition? I think that the, the the two biggest things that um, we learned is that learning is social. Uh, the the inspiration, the motivation that we have to better ourselves and be more educated is to be better for the people around us and um, and have a community around learning. And so that was that was, you know, just a huge hit to student morale. But I think the other thing that we learned is that we just don't have effective uh, remote learning tools. So teachers and students were defaulting to what was what's on the market today. And we learned all too well because kids are coming back anywhere between 12 to 14 weeks behind in math right now, that current tools don't work. Um, they're not engaging. Uh, they, they're, they, they don't help kids build the, the conceptual understanding needed uh, to build fluency upon. And so I think that there's just a greater um, momentum than ever to, to solve both these problems. How do we make learning inherently more collaborative and help kids build upon each other's thinking? And how do we, and how do we um, invest in more um, ed tech and remote learning solutions that are aligned to best practice pedagogies? Because we're now sensitized to the fact that they're not. And, you know, had, had we had better tools to rely on, we wouldn't have seen the, 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 the types of gaps that we currently see. So your um, e-learning product, Pandemic by Prisms, has got recently gone to market. How has that gone and what's new in that software? Yeah, so we, we had put that beta out uh, last November. Um, well, it, 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 was, it, it went up on App Lab um, in January, but um, that was really intended to get our first learning module out to garner as much feedback for our full algebra library. So this month, we launched the full library, which includes Pandemic. It's five modules. Um, all of our learning courses uh, target the, the, the core topics of a course. So for algebra, that's linear functions, quadratics, exponentials, systems of equations, and bivariate statistics. And um, we've now launched the, the full course, as well as the full uh, real-time um, dashboard for teachers, as well as the full wraparound curriculum. It's fantastic. What benefits do you find, what benefits are there, excuse me, to having access to a VR content library for students and teachers? I think the, the biggest feedback that we've been hearing is, one, it's practical. Kids for too long just didn't know what the application of math was. And so just the motivation and purpose to learn mathematics and invest time into it was minimal. So every single one of our modules, it's, it's driven by a real world problem that they see in their news, that they see in their environment. It's not, you know, Martha and Tom went to get apples, which is, you know, what you're, what you typically see in textbooks. Um, we've done a lot of work to create engaging problems that, that are urgent and relevant to this generation. So I think that's been hugely beneficial, the, the why, which has been hard for math, math teachers to truly communicate. Um, and I think the second thing is that kids need a radical, radically new memory of mathematics. I mean, you, 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 you mentioned algebra one to 90% of children in our system today, and you're going to get eye rolls, right? So what, what our product has done is it's created a new memory of what it is to do math. We've had so many students say, this doesn't even feel like I'm doing math. It just feels like I'm solving a problem, which is what every math class should be, because that's, that's what mathematics is about, solving problems that, that feel meaningful to you. And so I, I would say those are, the, those are the biggest pieces of feedback is that it feels relevant um, and it's a new memory. I can diverge. I mean, for folks who say that I'm not a math person or I'm not good at math, they now have a a, a divergent path um, to kind of create a new relationship with the subject um, that, you know, ordinarily would have been really difficult with existing tools. Thank you. And finally, 
you've already touched on this, but I just wanted to learn more about how PRISMS is appealing to a diverse skill set. So when you say a diverse skill set, what do you mean? I mean, a students of various educational backgrounds and skills before using the PRISMS software. Absolutely. So I think that one of the things that um, I felt as an educator for a long time is that kids have to leave so much of who they are at the front door before they walk into a math classroom. So as I mentioned, kids who inherently um, are highly kinesthetic or they use kinesthetic movements to sense make and stay focused and, and be engaged. Um, uh, students who use storytelling um, and, and are highly ima imaginative. Um, students who use you know, 3D and 2D drawings to really create connections between concepts, all those ways of sense making have largely been ignored. Uh, not to mention language learners. We've always seen our language learners as learners with a deficit. What we don't realize is that they know one language really well. So that's an asset. And how do we really harness that for them to learn additional languages? Um, and so what we've tried to do is ensure that there's as many ways to, to look at, sense make, and reason with mathematical ideas that before the only way to sense make with it was to either write an equation or draw a picture on a piece of paper. What we're just beginning to, you know, uh, that we're at the tip of the iceberg right now around what are the different representations of, of these mathematical concepts that we thought could only be represented as an equation or a graph or a table. And we're learning so much from our kids around how they use movement to communicate, how they use these different uh, visualizations to communicate, um, how they use these stories to communicate. Because ultimately a mathematical model could just be a context, right? And 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 our kids forget that because to them a math model is, is only a um, an equation. So I think that um, what we've opened up is a myriad of sense-making tactics and what we're learning is how different students with different sensibilities, different way of digesting and processing information are using these affordances within VR. Um, and the, the, there's, you know, we're at the beginning of our journey. And so to what extent language learners will require translations, um, being able to replay audio in different languages, um, other ways of, of language, language acquisition within the environment um, is something we're going to be looking closely at and, and quickly optimizing for every type of learner. But that's our goal. Is that no matter what your what what types of modality um, you feel most connected to, you need to have those affordances in this VR environment so that it's truly a one stop shop um, for every math learner. And that doesn't mean that every math learner is going to use every tool we have in there and every um, sort of support system in there. But there should be something in there for everyone. That's brilliant stuff. Actually, brilliant stuff. So for those watching, what's the best way to get in touch and to stay updated with Prisms of Reality? Well, you can follow us on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can always reach out to me on, on, on hello at, at Prisms VR on the team. Um, but, you know, just follow the journey. We're at the beginning. We have launched to our first 10,000 students. We are quickly going to be increasing that rollout to 50,000 at the end of this year. And then the sky's the limit for us as we currently are building out geometry, um, physics, chemistry, calculus, middle school, physical sciences, and math. We're going to quickly build out the entire grade six to 12 uh, curriculum and programming so this can get to as many kids as possible. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Rory. Great to talk. Cheers. That's it from myself. Get more XR news by subscribing to the XR Today News channel and by following our socials. I'm Marie Greener from XR Today. Thank you very much for watching.